Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul with TX141 Walsh, welcoming you to an all new Ace in a Day gameplay for the arcade mode of War Thunder. To celebrate 4,000 subscribers, we're going to be reviewing a slightly different plane today, and that is the Dornier Doe 217N2, a German night fighter coming to tier 3 and a battery rating of 4.0. For the purposes of our historical overview, as we've skipped over the N1 subvariant of the Dornier 217, We'll be focusing specifically on the origins of the N2 subvariant and the development history of the Dornier 217N variant in general following the N2. With that, we begin thus. Following the introduction into service of the Doe 217N1 in December of 1942, the M1 Night Fighter was to gradually see a number of field modifications. These included, but were not limited to, the FUG 25 friend or foe dual band radio identification system to tell the German flat batteries on the ground that the plane was a friendly. The FUG-16 VHF or Very High Frequency Radio as of April 1943 onwards, which operated outside of the region of the electromagnetic spectrum that the British Royal Air Force intended to jam, whereby this enabled the plane to keep in contact with the Himmelbert Directional Radar Ground Control Stations which formed the Kamhuber Line. There was also the swapping out of the 420mm MGFF cannon as taken from the J variant of the Dornier 217, these being swapped to 420mm MG151 cannon complementing the existing four 7.92mm MG-17 machine guns also in the nose. This increased the plane's burst mass significantly. On top of this and finally, both the upper and ventral 13mm MG-131 machine gun types were removed to decrease aerodynamic drag. This combination of modifications, as achieved using Umrus Belzetzer, or factory conversion kits, led to the plane being redesignated as the Doe 217N1U1. A further Schrager music, oblique or jazz music modification, was also introduced, as originally conceived by Ober Lieutenant Rudolf Schirnert, who is considered to be the father of the Schrager music modification for the Luftwaffe as of 1942, whereby the idea behind this modification was to mount a number of cannon in the Doe 217 central fuselage to fire upward at the unprotected belly of an enemy bomber, whereby such a firing position would minimise the risk of return fire from the bomber's turrets as they struggled to get an angle. Three modified M1s with two 20mm MG151 cannon mounted to fire upward at a 70 degree angle, sighted by means of a reflector sight attached to the cockpit roof, into testing in March of 1943. In the meantime, by May of 1943, the field modifications of the Doe 217 M1U1 were standardised to form the N2 sub variant, which supplanted the M1 as the main production variant. The plane was still to be powered by the same pairing of two Daimler Benz DB603A liquid cooled 1850 horsepower engines. Moreover, with Schoenert himself scoring the first ever Schrager music kill on the British bomber during an RAF attack over Berlin in May 1943, this being done using one of the modified M1 planes, and the Schrager music modification as fitted to Messerschmitt 110s, achieving a rather high kill count of up to 18 planes shot down confirmed as of September 1943. It was decided that the Schrager Music Rosetta or Field Mod Kit would be created for the N2. This modification contained four 20mm MG151 cannon flying upwards at a 70 degree angle. Adding an extra 1,102 pounds or 500 kilograms of mass to the plane, reducing its top speed at sea level by 3 miles per hour or 5 kilometers an hour. Henceforth, this Schrager Music armed subvariant was designated as the Doe 217 N2 R22. This is the plane you're seeing on screen today and would see service in the night fighter role up to the June of 1944, at which point it was retired from service. And without further ado, having concluded our historical overview, let us take a look how the Doe 217N2 handles in the skies of War Thunder Arcade. Today's gameplay is brought to you from the frontline map African Canyon. For this we'll be using the following setup. Stealth belts for our machine guns, the reason being that in our experience the stealth belts are proven to be the most powerful out of those available whereby if you do get an enemy fighter in your gun sight cleanly for 2-3 to three seconds, the volume of machine gun fire can be enough to shred them to pieces. For our 20mm cannon, we are taking the air target belts for two reasons. Firstly, the high proportion of high explosive incendiary mining shot shells within these belts means that we are able to rip apart any given fire in the sky very quickly. And secondly, the tracer attributed to the non-high explosive shells in these belts means that we have the ability to lock our rounds onto target in the case of the Schrager music whereby we use the tracers to correct our fire when we're inaccurate, as we're going to see later on in this gameplay. Our gun convergence is set to 500 meters as a formality, because all of our firepower is mounted down the center line and therefore not convergence reliant, and as for our fuel load, we are taking the standard 30 minute fuel load, 
to ensure we can make it to the end of the game unscathed on fuel capacity. Now what's important to know immediately about the climb rate of the N2 is, as you would expect, not exceptional. But it's only slightly above that of the bombers you're going to be seeing at your battle rating, ranging from the British Halifax round to the higher battle rating Dornier 217E2, which is at 4.7. And this is important because in the opening stages of a ground strike game, or a front line match as what you're seeing here, you can turn towards your friendly bombers after gaining a little bit of altitude, preferably say 500 meters altitude at a 20 degree angle of climb starting off at 325 km an hour climb speed, and what you'll be able to do is conceal yourself as a bomber and pretend you're one of the Dornier 217E series aircraft. Now whilst these do have a single 20mm cannon in the nose in the case of the E2, what should be noted is that your opposition may mistake you for one of them and not think that you've got four 20mm cannon in the nose and therefore you're going to be more incentivized to actually go for the head-ons against enemy fighters because you will have the net firepower advantage or at least the equilibrium. And in return, by catching foes by surprise, they may decide to snap right at the last moment, worried for their life about the fact they've now got this massive volume of 20mm cannon tracer heading towards them. So you can use your bombers as a way as a shield but at the same time as a means of ghosting your way up into the higher altitude regions of the sky. But the downside with this approach is you're going to be reliant on what your team is doing. Or if your team's decided not to contest higher altitude regions then you're going to be really at a deficit. But fortunately here we do have a friendly Spitfire Mark IIb who's been quite friendly and flying close. It means we have the ability to move in towards the centre of the map at 4,500 metres altitude. And the enemy team doesn't seem too bothered either about contesting higher altitudes, or at least holding on to them. Now as we make our way towards the enemy Sterling here out in the distance on the south, what we can see is that the slow nature of this aircraft as would be expected, and the fact that we've invested a lot of time into climbing and getting into our ideal altitude region, which is 3,000 to 6,000 meters altitude, we'll explain a bit more on that later on, it means that we're going to lose out in pursuing the bombers early on in the game, where a lot of players will be raring to go and knock out the likes of a Sterling before it can get to altitude or start taking our bases. And for us to get to this Sterling, note how we're having to sacrifice a lot of our potential energy by our altitude in order to bear down on them. And in doing this we're only going to be able to get to them as they decide to cut underneath our friendly Dornier 217 and our Spitfire Mark IIb. And the awkwardness of our controls at high speed, in more detail we'll cover that later, means that we're only able to get a hit on them and an eventual assist. So this is one of the more frustrating aspects in the fact that you are going to have to be the victim of your teammates aggression. Whether if your teammates decide to hunt down the enemy bombers right at the start or hunt down those fighters climbing and your teammates will typically be a lot faster than you or take a more direct route compared to what we've seen here, then you're not going to be getting those targets and you may find that throughout a good course of your match you're not going to be getting any kills for the opening few minutes, if any kills at all if you decide to continue with the approach that we're showing here. And this is something that's frustrated me every so often. But then again, playing this plane, you would expect a more patient style of play. Because your kills are not just going to come to you, you'll have to go search for your kills, but you don't have the speed to just grab the kills as they come along. You're going to have to take advantage of opportunities and the space that appears in between engagements. And so here we go. A B-25 has just spawned in on the enemy team and seems to want to level bomb, as they're not diving immediately. Now we could just dive towards them and attack them with our frontal guns, but this is a point where we can demonstrate the power of the Schrager music modification. Whereby with our guns pointing 70 degrees upwards, we need to come in underneath the B-25. So see how we're diving off of the B-25's approach angle at the moment. This is to not give away our intended approach. If anything, we're making ourselves look like a bomber right now. Because remember, the N1 also gets access to a small bomb payload. So we could confuse our opponent by making them think we're either an E2 or an N1 trying to drop some bombs. We now come under the B-25, but low enough so that way their rear firing 12.7mm machine gun type does not open fire, and it means they're not alerted to our presence through their turret firing, they'll only see us as they look around. And now we get into range to start opening fire. Now you know we're not using the lead indicator to do this, because that lead indicator is the lead indicator for if you were using the nose mounted 20mm cannon. Instead we have to apply it by guesstimation, raining our shots using the tracer afforded to us by the air target belt and we're able to set the left hand wing of that B-25 on fire and take off the right hand wing tip for a kill. And I must admit that's only one of three Schrager music kills that I've ever picked up in this plane and that's my proudest one because of how clean it was compared to the other two. But with that, an enemy Spitfire Mark IIA has come onto our six, we had to loop over to try and catch them in a head on. And what we can see is that despite their volume of fire they weren't able to kill us outright, they have set us on fire and then taking out the Spitfire, it's time for us to head home. But in doing so, as we gradually burn in the sky, what we're seeing here is one of the strengths of the 217N2, and that is its rather nice durability on the airframe. 
Now this plane is incredibly flammable and that's because you have a large number of fuel tanks whereby you have three across the central portion of your wing and you also have one in the ventral position of this plane. If the ventral fuel tank catches fire it's very likely this whole plane will go up in smoke because that's got the largest proportion of fuel and it will extend when it burns to the fuel tanks above it i.e. those in the wing. However if the wing mounted fuel tanks catch fire it's possible that all three of them will go up in flames as we've just seen but the ventral one will not be affected so if you're going to take this plane down by setting it on fire you want to hit the ventral position and you want to hit it clearly so that's the point where the fire starts but we've been able to get away with it here and it means that we can gradually saunter our way back to our own airfield because the airframe of this plane particularly the central fuselage really holds up to damage well and whilst we did lose the controls of our aileron we haven't lost our ability to use our rudder or turn to our elevator, meaning that we can bring this plane home, and we've only taken significant damage to our right hand engine. And because we've still got one engine active and half of the performance of the right hand engine, because the engines of this plane, funny enough, really do hold up to taking damage, to the point where they really do need to go deep red before they start to lose performance, and at that point they'll lose 50% performance, we're able to just gradually coast our way home making the most of the altitude we also had, and that was conferred on us by our patient gameplay of holding on to our potential energy IR altitude until the B-25 came along. So you can see, or at least hope to see, how everything's linking together already, i.e. the approach that we're taking, and the way that we're very gradual in our tactics, and it means that we're able to start extracting results from the game. And as we come down at this point, we note that we're missing a portion of our landing flaps on the left-hand wing, and the plane is starting to tilt slightly towards the right. And that means we're going to have to effectively drop the plane on its landing gear, but just taking our time, managing things carefully, we're able to do so. A little bit harsher than perhaps we'd like, as we can see here, bouncing up, but the landing gear can take it. She's a tough old bird, and she finally gets home, we can get her repaired and get her back up into the sky. But with this, as we start to come to a halt, we now have a key area of difficulty that appears. Once you're down low, how easy is it for you to get back up to altitude, and preferably above 3,000 meters altitude, and up towards 6,000 meters altitude because in that range is where your ideal performance comes in in terms of engine and controllability. And this is going to be a time consuming process. Now let's start to articulate why this is the case. Below 2,000 meters altitude, as we're about to see, the engine performance of this plane starts to suffer, particularly in terms of climb rate, but also in terms of straight line acceleration. And with your acceleration already being rather poor from your stall speed of 120 kilometers an hour all the way up to the threshold of 375 km an hour, at which point your acceleration depreciates even further, or 425 km an hour with more uh, with war emergency power, I should say, the difficulty only increases, and now we begin our journey. Taking off, we're already at 440 meters altitude, and we're starting to build. Now my advice about building up altitude in a heavy fighter such as this is not to push for extreme climb angles. Typically, you want to try and hold a climb angle of no greater than 15 degrees. Sometimes you may want to be a little bit more aggressive at the very lowest of altitudes, so you can use your more emergency power as seen here, just to build up a little bit more above the ground in case somebody tries to dive on you, either they streamline for you from their spawn to your spawn, and it means that you're going to have to try and build up a little bit of speed by going into the shallowest of dives, just to provide a bit of survival whilst your teammates come down and cover your six, hopefully. But by getting a little bit of space above the ground now, and therefore that minor safety net of being able to dive away, we can now start to build up our altitude gradually. But also note how we're using the space created by our teammates to build up altitude at this point. Whereby we're not intending to just sit over our airfield, we will return to the airfield if we feel the aggression is coming and use the AA guns position there to rip apart our opponent hopefully. But we're starting to migrate our way towards our northernmost base, because it hasn't been damaged yet and it may be the case we can pick off an unsuspecting ground attacker nearby. Well, on top of that, we're just moving out into the space so that way we can build up some altitude and speed by just going around in a circuit, going from the north now towards the south. And doing this, it means that you're not going to be a central target, i.e. the enemy team's not going to see, oh look, there's that Dornier 217N2 just loitering around in a particular region, but we're gradually migrating, and it means that we're starting to spread our presence as a threat, because we can see the Wellington coming towards us. Now it looks as though they're already being attacked by a friendly Spitfire, but if they're unable to drop their bombs accurately on the base, and instead continue down towards the lower altitude to try and run away from our friendly aircraft who are chasing it, it may be the case we can intercept. But here they decide to split us and run away from our friendly Yak-9 and the Spitfire coming back in, so it means we're just here as a safety net or a goalkeeper essentially. And in return, with the enemy fighters now coming on strong in this region, we begin to react by turning away. Much like we did at the start of the game, using the ability to shield ourselves behind our teammates to build up altitude. 
Now, of course, this isn't going to work every time, and sometimes you'll just get those foes who decide to focus you really hard because they know you haven't got maneuverability. And it's with that we should start talking about the maneuverability of this aircraft. As you'd expect, the turn circle of this plane is extremely poor, whereby you're going to struggle to outturn anything, even the heaviest of bombers, the British heavy bombers in particular, or the medium bombers such as the Wellington going into the likes of the Sterling and the Halifax, are going to run rings around you in terms of maneuverability. On top of that, if we start breaking it down into components, what we can see is that our roll rate is very weak, whereby as standard, you're going to struggle to roll this plane, and when you go from and what is 500 km an hour to 650 km an hour, so coming on to high speed maneuvers here, you'll find that you lose 75% of that already poor roll rate, meaning that rolling in a boom and zoom style approach is near on impossible. And to compound this, your elevator, which is actually all right in terms of initial response but starts to become very heavy, when you find with your elevators, once you start going to high speed, it actually becomes a lot more responsive, particularly once you go beyond 500 km an hour, all the way up to your maximum dive speed of 842 km an hour. So you've really got a strange contrast here where you can play about on the elevator to some points whereby it becomes so responsive that it can take you by surprise, but you haven't got the ability to roll the aircraft. And then just to confuse the picture even more, your rudder, which is absolutely disastrous on this aircraft, whereby your flat rudder turn capability is extremely poor and takes a considerable amount of time, what you'll find is when you go from 600 to 700 km an hour, your rudder loses 25% of its performance, meaning that your ability to be precise in dropping down on the foe, who may make a minor adjustment to their flight path at the last moment, you haven't got that precision to be able to get an accurate shot on the opposition or follow them as they're starting to break off. And therefore, when you're going for a boom and zoom pass, you really do need to catch your foes by surprise. I, they shouldn't be expecting you to drop on them. I mean, most people probably wouldn't expect you to drop on them in a Dornier 217 N2, because in my experience of flying this plane, I've rarely seen any other Dornier 217 Ns or Js in the sky. I've only seen the E's. But when you are flying this plane, if you can catch foes by surprise in a straight line boom and zoom pass, I, they're not going to react to you because they haven't seen you coming, then you'll be able to tear them apart. If they're allowed to react at any point, getting the kill will be incredibly difficult once you go above 500 km an hour, because you start to lose your already poor roll rate, and once you hit 600 km an hour, your ability to tweak your line of sight, or line of fire we should say, becomes impossible. But having put this plane down a little bit now, what's on the plus side? Well, when going into a high speed dive, what you find is, due to the overall mass and inertia of this plane as a result, its ability to build up speed in a dive is actually respectable, whereby you'll get up to your maximum dive speed of 842 km an hour at a decent rate. Now, you're not going to be outrunning the likes of a P 47 Thunderbolt in a dive, but what it means is that you can actually, funnily enough, match the dive acceleration of a Spitfire in a dive, such as the Spitfire F Mark 9. And in return, this means that if you do feel as though you're under threat, as you're starting to make your way to 4,000 meters altitude plus, you can dive away from this opposition and at least maintain the distance between you and them, if not start to just pull out a little bit of distance. And this gives you a safety net to pull back to your teammates who will hopefully go for the target on your six, whereby you'll be baiting the opponent onto them. Now unfortunately with that, what we also have to consider is that you have a contrasting picture of energy retention. Now over a short distance in a dive, the energy retention of this plane is actually phenomenal. Whereby, when you go into a dive and you drop approximately 1,500 meters altitude in, say, a 70 degree angle dive or higher, all the way up to 90 degrees, and then you decide to loop back up as part of the zoom part of your boom and zoom attack, you'll be able to regain all the altitude you have sacrificed. And we're going to do a seminal boom and zoom pass here on the P 47 Thunderbolt, going for the head on. And what we're diving down, so this is going to show the energy retention in a very gradual dive, ripping them apart, while we're setting their engine on fire. And as we break up, we can see that we can retain our position in the sky, not having to worry about them because they're burned to death, and we'll go for the Halifax now. And it means that you can hold your energy when coming out of boom and zoom passes to be able to go through in successive passes. Coming onto the Halifax, we've really damaged our right-hand wing, whereby it seems as though they've lost all the controllability on that side, and we come around again on the P-47 to finish them off. Use our war emergency power to close the distance a little bit more quickly before somebody else is able to get in there and take them out. Now, with this picture of your ability to retain energy rather than in the vertical, it's when you come into the horizontal that things get really difficult, because in the turn fight, your energy retention is disastrous, to the point that if an opponent forces you into a loop, you're going to be losing practically all of your energy, because the looping capability of this plane is poor, and this compounds what we said earlier about the elevator, that its initial response is good, but as you continue that response and it's to go for a loop, your loop circle is incredibly wide, but you'd expect this because of the size and the nature of the aircraft as we pick up the assist on the Halifax. 
Your straight line energy retention when coming out of a dive, however, is very good, whereby you have the ability to retain a large chunk of your kinetic energy once you come out of your dive and your speed drops below 700 km an hour. Above that, your speed drops off rather rapidly, but as soon as you go below 700 km an hour, you enter this phase whereby you hold a lot of speed, and it only decays gradually in level flight. I mean that once again, you have the ability to hold distance on those who would chase you in long distance dives. Now making our way towards the SP2C, who's just spawned in and seems to be loitering high in the sky before going down for targets, we'll hope to catch them in the head on. We can see that now that we're starting to get back up to altitude, or we have got back up to altitude, we're starting to feel a lot more comfortable. When our opposition aren't trying to press us down, we're able to go for head-ons and use our firepower advantage to cut them out of the sky, particularly those foes with wing-mounted guns, such as the P-47, because if they haven't got their gun set to say 800 meters convergence, they're going to be at a disadvantage in the long-range head-on. And we only need to hit once, really, of our 20mm cannon burst, pardon me, to do the considerable damage. Now, the other item of note, then, is what happens when nobody decides to play up high, because what could happen at any given point right now is that the enemy team just decides, you know what, we're going to spend the rest of the game down low. Well, this is where the boom and zoom tactics come in and your ability to catch people by surprise in a dive comes in. And we're going to start by picking on the P-63 King Cobra, hopefully. Well, that's our initial target. But we can see they're diving on sun, so we switch to the P-47. And as we can see, as they're flying on a pretty much linear path and we're trying to predict where they're going as much as possible, we only need one hit of our 20mm cannon burst to rip them apart and pick up a kill. And this is where you will take the opposition by surprise for you will expect to see this aircraft diving down them from altitude and attacking them with such ferocity. And as we zoom back up, we see how much of the altitude we regain. Now we did make it an extended dive, so we will expect to lose some altitude, whereby we dove down from approximately 4,000 meters altitude and we've had to loop out at 3,600, but you can see the vertical energy conservation in effect. It's very strong. And it means that we can now go into a second boom and zoom pass. But here you know I call it off early. And this is because what I'm realizing is if I carry on this path, I'm boom and zoom diving towards the enemy team. And this is something you cannot afford to do in this plane, unless there's only say one or two aircraft left in the skies of the enemy. Because when you go into that style of approach, the only way out of that boom and zoom pass is towards the enemy. Because if you go into a loop, you bleed out all of your energy, as mentioned earlier. I into one of those tight loops, those sudden loops down at low altitude. Whereby you're effectively starting to move into the turn fight era, rather than the boom and zoom style era. So with that, you have to pick your boom and zoom runs as if they're defensive, whereby at the minimum, they need to be going across the map, perpendicular to the spawn point of the enemy team and your team, i.e. the straight line between them, but at best, diving down and cutting back to friendly territory. And we're going to pick on the P-47 here, hopefully, another one of the P-47 series, in order to get them out of the sky. Whereby, as you can see, they haven't expected us to dive on them, and we're opening fire at long distance here, hoping to pick up some hits, but none so far. But we reacted to a Messerschmitt 109 who's been climbing up underneath us, we saw them a little bit earlier, whereby we're now looping over the top, and as we can see as they're climbing up, they're right near their stall at this point, and therefore we can drop down on this F1 and cut them out of the sky for another kill. Now we can see how our foes may take us for granted in the fact that we may not react to them because we don't have the maneuverability, and they'll try to bait us into a turn fight, but by being in a very nice energy state there, we could come around and cut them to pieces, and at this point we go for a reload. So what about ammo capacity? Is it something you have to worry about? Well, with 4,000 machine gun rounds, or 1,000 per machine gun, 800 cannon rounds for both the Shrug Music Quad setup and also the 20mm uh, cannon mounted in those, so I said Shrug, I mean Schrager, it means that reloads are going to be relatively infrequent when you're able to catch foes with a clear shot. However, if you find yourself in a situation whereby you're not able to get a clean shot and you're pretty much spraying to hope to hit the pro, the foe I should say, I spray and pray, then that's where the difficulty will come in in the fact you're going to expend a lot of ammunition and you may find yourself getting caught out with a reload a little bit sooner than expected. But in general, ammunition is not a problem. Now coming around again, what we can see at this point as well is that the enemy team has started to gain air superiority in terms of relative numbers and I'm starting to change up my approach to use my altitude advantage against the opposition in terms of performance. And as we said earlier on, the ideal altitude range of this plane is 3000 to 6000 it caps off at 6,500 in terms of maximum altitude because above 6,500 meters altitude, you lose engine performance and you also lose controllability, particularly on the elevator of this plane, making turns very difficult. But the majority of our opposition at our battle rating will typically start to lose performance around the 6,000 to 6,500 meter altitude marker. And unlike us, 
their altitude dominance will be typically at below 5,000 meters altitude. So once we start heading up towards 6,000 meters altitude, we start to really come into a world where we're at maximum performance, meanwhile our opponents are starting to drop off, or at least not going to be as comfortable up high. The likes of the Yak-9s that we're going to see, such as the Yak-9T and Yak-9K, come to mind in this regard with their low altitude dominated engines. So in return, we are going to be creeping off to the side because we just don't have the ability to go storming in there and pick up a kill. We want to survive to the end of the game, but it's not as though we're going to hide in the back for the rest of the game. We're just preparing our position. Now aside this, what else is there to note in the meantime? Well, some other things you must consider are that you don't have any defensive armament. Whereby the downside of this plane compared to the M1 is the lack of a defensive machine gun turret. You don't have the two 13mm machine guns unlike in the N1, and this means in return that when somebody is, is on your 6, you are going to be only saved by your teammates coming in or your opponent making a complete and utter blunder in trying to shoot you down, i.e. jamming their guns, or alternatively crashing into a landmass or crashing into you. Now you can absorb the occasional ram, which I've personally found, although I wouldn't rely on it. Every so often somebody will crash into this plane, you'll carry on flying. Every so often somebody will crash into the plane and you fall out of the sky with them. So it's not a tactic I can recommend, but that is something to keep in mind. Now outside of that, in terms of defensive posture, the overall posture that we're seeing now is one where we are having to go on the defensive, but as we go up to 5,000 meters altitude and we use our war emergency power to build up a little bit more speed, we build up our aggression at this point. And we know we're going to have to suppress those who go for us simply because we now have the altitude position to do so. And we're going to start with the enemy Leo Bomber and the 451 that we saw very briefly coming from spawn and we're hoping to dive down on that shortly. As we make our way over then, we can see how we're having to be patient and we're waiting for the game to essentially develop we're not going straight in, we can't go charging in. Unlike say the Japanese heavy fighters such as the Kai 108, whereby you can be a lot more aggressive because of their greater performance thresholds and their greater maneuverability. Now we see the Leo, we're getting ready to dive on it. And then we start to build up our speed at this point. What about the ideal speed range of this plane for going into an engagement? Well, it's between 300 and 400 kilometers an hour because of all the high speed lockup thresholds associated to this plane when you go into a high speed dive. And also because of your poor acceleration in general, getting above 400 km an hour is extremely difficult. Which is why I cannot recommend it to be any higher. You could potentially push this up to 450 km an hour if you're able to get to that speed, but that's going to be difficult. As we can see here, with the Leo flying on a relatively straight path, we're able to get successive hits into their fuselage, set them on fire, and that will beat them out of the game. And in return, we now go straight for the head-on with the Yak-9 here. We're going to take the initiative and try to cut them out of the sky before they can hit us. Opening the fire at 1.6 kilometers, and they start to break out, trying to dodge the incoming fire, we swooping back in and underneath us, but that gives us ample time to rip them out of the sky to pick up a double strike, and our seventh kill. Now it's at this point that we start to head back up and we can see how the straight line energy retention and the vertical energy retention are working in harmony here to give us the ability to now swarm all the way back up to above 5,000 meters. I should say swoop there. And now we come around because we know we've got a cannon stand coming our way. And this is where you're going to see the P-51 pilot put themselves in a bit of an awkward situation. They've been climbing towards us for a good amount of time, so they're already in a low energy state. But they're probably not expecting us to go charging towards them, and you'll see here they decide to opt out of the head-on, but because of their relative energy state, they don't have the ability to swing past us, i.e. do a snap roll or anything along those lines. I mean, as they lose all their energy and try to cut across the front of us, we've got a clean shot on target, and we pick up our eighth and final kill of this match, and it's worked out in our favour. And this is where if you enable this plane to get into a region whereby it's able to maximise its performance, particularly up incredibly high, 5,000 metres plus, it really works well. And this is the outer region in which you'll be able to hunt down the heaviest of bombers because you start to build up that consistency in performance which a lot of aircraft start to lag. But this game is gradually coming to its end because of the timer associated on the frontline match whereby it's a 25 minute timer with our team only having us left in the sky by the looks of things and our team having the greater number of tickets this is actually going to enable our team to win the match because of our continued presence in the sky and with that let's go take a look at the post game stats. With our 8 kills and single assist, we're able to pick up 46,060 silver lines and 3,548 research points. To defeat the W217N2 in a given matchup then, I can recommend one or two general approaches. The first one is the most obvious one, and that is to turn fight with this aircraft, as its wide turn circle and poor overall maneuverability means that this plane is really going to struggle in a turn fight against all the opposition it's going to encounter. 
meaning that even the wider turn circles of the likes of the P47 Thunderbolt and the Focke 190A1 will not compare to the wider nature of this plane's turn circle, and once you're on its 6, it has no defensive armour to counter your position, meaning it's going to have to rely on its teammates to get onto your 6 to dispatch you off of its 6. Option number two, if you're feeling a little bit more daring, is to use your superior climb rate, again attributed to the vast majority of planes at this aircraft's battle rate and tier, in order to outclimb this plane from the outset, get above it, and then use boom and zoom strikes to take it out of the sky. As whilst it is durable, through successive strikes, this plane will fall out of the sky eventually. Just be wary of the Doe 217 N2 pilot trying to lure you into a head-on, because that's going to be tantamount to suicide if you get it wrong, and it means they're going to pick up a cheeky kill on you. But outside these two approaches, hopefully today we have demonstrated in our own Doe 217 N2 that a slow, gradual pace of play can be rather rewarding. Now we're fortunate enough for this frontline game to go on for the full 25 minute duration, but it goes to highlight how this plane deserves a slower method, whereby unlike a lot of the planes it's battery in tier, you cannot afford to be outwardly aggressive from the start, but instead play in the back, play in the second line role, and wait for the opportunities to start to appear, whereby the sky opens up as planes fall out of it or dive down to lower altitudes and you can start to operate more effectively. Your main target will be enemy bombers because they will not be able to hold up against your sustained fire from either the 20mm cannon in the nose or the 20mm Schrager music configuration. And this means that with accurate fire, you can rip these foes apart and really start to make a difference to the enemy team's bombing capability, whereby it'll be nullified and you can start to then pick on enemy fighters down at lower altitudes if you're given the space to operate and they decide to fly in straight lines, not expecting you to be able to dive on them and take them out in boom and zoom passes. And even then when you do happen to miss your pass, do not forget the rather decent energy retention of this plane in the vertical and in the straight line, giving it the ability to frustrate those who would chase it for a good period of time. And in return, this is one heavy fighter that whilst it is laughable to some, to me it's actually been quite a rewarding plane to fly. And so I've been TX141, and if you have enjoyed this video why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. And I'd just like to quickly say thank you to all of you for supporting my journey to 4000 subscribers to date whereby it has been a long journey, but a fruitful one all the way. And I couldn't have got there without you guys and girls right behind me, helping me to stay positive and keep on flying high in the sky. But until next time, as always, ladies and gentlemen, take care and good luck in the sky.